Sniper Elite 5. You've bought the game, you've beaten the campaign, you've rage quit at a multiplayer, you're desperate for new content. And hearing your cry, Rebellion offers you water in the midst of this drought. Two season passes at $40 a pop. Are they worth it? Are you getting your money's worth? Can your relationship withstand the flaming appeal of Tank Top Carl? Probably not. Now, before we begin, here's a quick note about some continuity. So instead of owning the game on Steam or something, I play on Game Pass and bought the season passes through there when they went on sale. The reason I'm telling you this is because despite holding up to a PC rebuild and Windows reinstall, one day my cloud saves just updated my local save file and brought my campaign rank back down to zero. I'm not sure why. The Xbox app on PC doesn't quite give you as much control over cloud saves as Steam does, so right after recording my stuff for Landing Force and the Kill Hitler mission, I lost out on all my attachments, unlocks, pretty much anything you get from completing the campaign as thoroughly as I have. Now, despite every fiber in my being wanting to scream and put off this video so I can go unlock everything over again, FUCK THAT! So when I review certain DLC weapons, everything will be stock. Hopefully this is less of a pain and actually gives me a better basis for reviewing the DLC weapons, but if you're wondering why I'm not starting missions with certain loadouts, besides the two mentioned previously, that's why. Alright, on to Season Pass number 1. First, we'll dig into the cosmetics and extra weapons. Season 1 gives us the following weapon packs. The DL Carbine is great on those smaller to medium sized maps and engagements, but you'd really want to pair it with some armor piercing or soft point ammo. It's not super powerful, and its main selling point is the stealth factor. The PPSH needs no introduction, it's the go-to tool when you want to shoot 30 rounds into someone as a warning shot. It has some inconsistent performance that really depends on how close you are to someone, but 9 out of 10 times it will stop someone in their tracks. The HS-22 is probably my most used pistol. It's a quiet boy with some decent penetrating power. It's the Timothy Chalamet of pistols. In my personal opinion, regardless of if you want to go loud or go quiet, having a silenced pistol is a non-negotiable. That's just me though. The win Co. 1885 is probably the most fun to use out of all the DLC weapons. It's loud, it's powerful, if you hit something, it stops. It has a very slow reload, doesn't have a great zoom, and it's a little unsteady, but these all feel like very fair trade-offs. The 1885 is the definition of one shot, one kill. The Irma 36 fills the gap of a quieter SMG without any modifications, but the trade-off here, in my opinion, is not worth it. It's got a slow rate of fire, not much stopping power behind it, and you can get some of the other weapons even quieter without such a huge sacrifice. It'll do the job, but you just won't have as much fun doing it. And coming up as our last DLC weapon for Season Pass number 1, it's the Drilling Shotgun. This is the nearsighted cousin of the 1885, it has even more anger issues, and just stop taking its meds. It's also incredibly fun to use, and it's so powerful, it's like anything within its firing range just gets frozen in time. Like if you get hit with it, you need to take a second to realize which of your inner organs are exploring the roof tiles. Next up, we'll look at the weapon skins, and eh. The P-Dot skin just looks like a really awkward mix of colors, and the Oak Leaf skin makes your weapons look kind of dirty. Calling either a camo is stretching it, unless you just so happen to vomit up some Campbell's veggie soup and also need to hide your Thompson. The character skins, on the other hand, they are far better. The Ghillie suit does have some actual versatility, although the more convincing one is still a level 50 unlock in multiplayer, and in Invasion it's locked behind a kill requirement. The the immersion factor you get from it, however, makes it a bunch of fun to use. And the tank top, or as I like to call it, the John McClane special, just makes you feel really fucking cool. Carl gets to show off his other guns for once, and really the only thing that could make this even better is if the cutscenes actually showed your equipped skin instead of just sweater Carl every single time. Alright, now that the appetizers are out of the way, let's start with the new missions. Now I don't want anyone out here thinking I don't read your comments or take your advice. In my review for the base game, a lot of people gave me their thoughts on certain gameplay 
gameplay strategies and why they like them, primarily non-lethal and assault-heavy runs, both of which I tried for this mission. First up was my non-lethal run, and holy sweet Christ, I know I called it a different way to play. I tried to pass it off as people wanting to change up their playstyle, but no, this is masochism. This is cock and ball torture on your birthday, because it hurts, but you kind of like it and want to do it again. For starters, it takes way longer and you have to be very mindful of your ammo, because you can only take one extra type of ammo with you, unless you know where to find non-lethal ammo throughout the level, it very well may be the only stuff you get, which means that your only reliable method of dispatching enemies is getting up close and personal. That being said, I sure wish Carl would use something other than his knife for these non-lethal takedowns, because every time I see it come out, I have a goddamn heart attack. Another big difficulty factor here is that non-lethal doesn't dispatch your enemies in any permanent way. I mean, obviously. But if any of your victims are discovered, they can be woken back up. Meaning instead of having a body count slowly going up that makes your life easier, if you don't hide the bodies, they can very quickly be back up and hunting you down. However, none of these are total deal breakers for me. Meanwhile, switching over to my full-on assault run, I actually find myself appreciating larger maps even though I'm sniping a lot less. Because with the larger maps, you have more segmentation between clusters of enemies. That means you can go ape shit in one section without drawing the entire map's worth of enemies down on your position. The way the encounters usually went this time around is they would start with a big, loud-ass rifle. I purposely wasn't using any sound masking as I wanted to play super recklessly and just feel out the viability of this playstyle. Usually my playthroughs feature a good amount of stealth, only going loud when my back is really against the wall, and SC5 really does start to take on a different vibe when you just allow yourself to be allowed as hell. It's really not for me, but to the people who commented saying they enjoy it this way, more power to you. Now onto the review of the map itself. The default start is Dead Man Cove, which is an incredibly fitting name, cause... It gives you a great vantage point to check out some of your objectives and pick out some key sniping spots you might want to hit up next. It just goes to show you don't necessarily need elevation to have some great sightlines. Of course, the looming menace over this entire map is the fortress built into the cliff face here, and oh boy is it perilous. One of our two main objectives is to destroy or sabotage the gun battery on top. We can do this either by taking out the power to the turrets or feeding them some booby-trapped shells. A word of warning, never accept any craft dinner from me. The other main objective is to sabotage some radio equip, which is a classic. You can do this either by cutting the cables, keeping it up, or shooting the fuck out of the radio equipment. Not this radio gear though, or this stuff. This. This is the right stuff. For secondary objectives, we have a kill list target and a docked U-boat to destroy. For the U-boat, there's a few fun ways to take it out, but the best, in my opinion, is to sabotage the control, set these explosives, swing out over top, and boom. For our kill list target, it's a man by the name of Herman Kraus, and the unique kill opportunity is to silence the sommelier with a bit of rat poison. I love that Sniper Elite lets us ring a bell when it's time to set up the kill so we're not just sitting around waiting for our guy. Bottoms up. This map does have some fairly firm segmentation between its areas, but it still has loads of twisting paths and methods to get between them. Anywhere you need to get vertically likely does have some vines or vegetation of some kind that will allow you to climb it, which kind of smooths over any gripes I have about invisible walls. I still hate them, but if you're giving me more opportunities to get around them, that's A1 in my books. Previously, we tended to see Rebellion's design changes for the next game start to creep in during the DLC of the current one. Let's hope that's the case here. Next up, Conqueror. Right off the bat, we find an extremely confusing scene. In the front yard of Castle Wolfenstein, there's a recently bombed trench system and a town that's still smoking. From the very first vantage point, you'll be rewarded for taking your time and studying the trench system slowly, as the enemies blend in far too well. When we head on down there, we don't want any surprises. In the Conqueror map, we have a bunch of key objectives. We have to kill General Koenig, who's hiding out in the larger fortress. We have to eliminate three snipers hiding out in the rubble of the nearby town, and we have to destroy a roving tiger tank. Side objectives include neutralizing four artillery guns, two in the trenches and two inside the fortress, as well as our kill list target, Christian Hoffman. For this mission, I really took it slow and tried to stumble upon things naturally. Usually the first thing I do is pop open my map, find the closest objective, and go in that direction, but this time I just wandered down the road. Taking some guards out, I was able to sneak around to the backside of the castle where the tiger tank is hiding, and I don't know if it was glitched or something,
something, but the only way it would ever drive is forward and back. No matter how hard I tried to bait it closer, it would at no point turn and show me that bright red sweet spot. So I fed it a TNT sandwich to ground it in place, circled around back, and none of that mattered because I just shot it with a Panzerfaust. The theme with this review is that I'm really trying to play somewhat differently and go against my first instinct. Now, clearing the trench system to take out the AA guns, on the other hand, that was textbook. I took my time, checked my corners, silenced the whole way, and set the longer timer on the satchel charge so I could bug out before everyone came down on my position. From here, I wound my way into town, and holy shit, does this feel like an OG sniper elite level? Hunting my way through the rubble to take out each of the three snipers was incredibly fun, and stepping out only to get hit by a scope glint and having to go, where the sweet fuck is this guy, was great. It's no secret that counter sniping objectives are some of my favorite, and this one is no exception. The three snipers are spread out fairly well, and they're not all hidden in the obvious locations. I even stumbled upon one and was able to get a melee kill. I know I always get pumped when there's a ruined city section, but I really do think this is my favorite so far. This whole part of the map is a rat's maze, but with just enough landmarks to make me feel like orienting myself wasn't difficult. Even even if I did accidentally take out the kill list target with a mine. Target down. I mean, successfully hit him with a chandelier, of course. With everything completed outside the fortress perimeter, it's time to make our way inside, and despite Carl's warnings, the main gate's gonna be heavily guarded. I should try to find a way around it. I quite literally just walked through the front door. Now, inside the fort, it's not that grand. Like, if you look at the damage the bombing runs have done to this town, you won't be surprised to learn that the carpet bombing matches the drapes. Inside the two courtyards, we'll find a bunch of enemy soldiers milling about. I made the mistake of thinking the coast was clear after taking some shots with my unsuppressed rifle, but while I was mid-zip, they all started coming out of the woodworks. This feels like one of those ads for knives where they cut through a tomato, except this ain't a tomato, it's Heinz. Getting inside the castle, we once again find a bunch of different pathways for how we could have gotten up here, which is always nice to see, but the coolest part is getting up to the little office area where the general is held up, being able to just dunk a grenade down on top of him. I'm very pleased to see there's an alternate option here if you didn't find the key or don't want to use a satchel charge. Overall, I really enjoyed this mission too. It's got a ton of stuff to get done, and it feels like a very well-designed map. Now, to round out the first season pass, let's take a look at the latest installment of everyone's favorite, the Let's Kill Hitler mission. Target Fuhrer takes us to Hitler's mountain residence, the Berghof. And getting the obvious out of the way, this map is incredible. The main compound, at least to my eye, matches up super well to the photos I could find. Aside from a few differing textures and some liberties taken with the scale of everything, I think Rebellion did a really great job recreating it. The real Berghof was demoed in the 50s, so it didn't turn into a tourist site or pilgrimage for neo-Nazis. So considering the fact they couldn't go view anything in real life, aside from the foundation maybe, the end result is pretty substantial. Where this level starts to lose me slightly is the objectives and the issue of timing. See, when you first load into this level, you start fairly far away from the main building, and it's basically 50-50 whether you'll go straight for the main objective or go explore this little section over to the left. If you do that, you get the secondary objective, which is to take out the radio antenna so that nobody can call for help. Completing that, you make your way down the mountain tunnel where you get to find a copy of Hitler's schedule. It'll tell you what order Hitler will be doing certain activities. The problem is there's no way to know how far through the daily schedule he's gotten by the time you get over to the main house. Regardless, at the end of the day he'll go stand in his room, but you'd really only know that if you'd looked it up. That's of course with the assumption that he doesn't glitch out. I get what the variety of different kill methods were encouraged to replay this level a bunch, but I would think you want people to at least get to him before he passes all the checkpoints. This feels like a mission that would have really benefited from some sort of time I'm telling mechanic, but and this isn't the first time I've had this sentiment about Sniper Elite, when this level works as intended, it's so fucking good. The different traps and kill opportunities are just as tongue-in-cheek and batshit insane as I'd expect. There's a good amount of different medals tied to this level that will have you coming back to play more, you just have to figure out how to best approach this map. If I were you, the first thing i do on my first playthrough is make a beeline for the guardhouse starting location. Use this for all playthroughs going forward. That way you can kill Hitler at each of the points on his daily itinerary with ease, and then mop up the side objectives on your way out.
And now that we've reached the halfway point, before we start into Season Pass number 2, if you like this kind of content and want to see more, please like and subscribe. It helps me out a ton, and I promise you're going to want to see what I've got coming up in the next couple months. And on to Season Pass 2, starting out once again with the weapon packs. First up, we have the prolific Soviet workhorse. You know it, you love it. The Moisen rifle is bolt action, has some great damage, but is very slow firing. You'd better make sure you kill whatever you just shot shot at, because a redo might take a couple seconds. The Shogun is another shotgun, albeit one with 5 shots and less stopping power. It's still good up close and is a bit more of an all-rounder. The Peterson rifle so far has the flattest stats of all the DLC weapons, and it doesn't actually come with a scope. It's extremely stable, and I found it to be quite a maneuverable weapon when used in more close quarter scenarios, like in different survival maps, but to get any long-range use out of it, you're gonna want to scope it up. The Terror rifle, on the other hand, is very stable, easy to control, slightly more powerful, but at a much slower rate of fire. We also have the Grease Gun, it's not too loud, decent control, absolutely zero stopping power, I fucking hate this gun. Now, the Mod 712 is a full auto beast. It's great if you need a quick sidearm to pepper someone to create some breathing room, but to really tame this gun, it's gonna take a few mods. Looking next at the weapon skins, British Dazzle is meant to be an homage to the paint job used on British tanks in North Africa. It adds a bit of pop to any commando's weapons of war, but the Patriot skin, this is where it's at. Getting shot by someone using this weapon skin is an automatic five-figure hospital bill, your truck gets a pair of brass hangers, and you get to come kick my ass for how I spell the word color. Ooh fucking raw, brother. The character skins this time around are also much more varied. I think the British Bomber skin is probably my favorite out of all of them. It just gives me some big Indiana Jones vibes. Look how luxuriant. The Air Auxiliary skin is another cool one, representing the very real women's Air Auxiliary which transported new and repaired military planes around the UK during the war. The Liberator skin is one I slept on for far too long, but after I took a spin in it while writing the section, it's pretty solid. It's so French that it feels like the melee takedowns while wearing this should be replaced by kissing enemies directly on the mouth. Probably the weakest in my opinion is the American Airborne skin. It's nothing special, but if you're someone who maybe wants to roleplay a little bit, more power to you. Jumping into missions, we're going to start out with Rough Landing. Besides feeling a lot like a spiritual sequel to the Regilino Viaduct mission in SE5, the Rough Landing DLC mission serves as, so far, the most enjoyable and cohesive mission, at least in my opinion. With the Nazis on the run, the SOE has reconnaissance missions flying overhead to monitor their beeline towards Germany. This mission revolves around tracking down not one, but three downed recon planes. We start out scoping what we can from our entry point and find three pillars of smoke rising up from the forest floor. Zeroing in on each of these, Carl actually makes a comment on each one. It's nice to see our objectives communicated in some way other than just looking at the map, but specifically when I'm actually looking at them, not just when I'm in their general vicinity. When spying the three downed planes, I also noticed this big ass bridge, and immediately I thought back to the Regilino Viaduct mission. If I get to blow up this bridge, I'm going to be one happy boy. Before sneaking into the nearby town, I followed the trail left, where I stumbled upon a a roving tiger tank. I can only assume it was this guy. He ratted me out to Nemo, who then called the tank in on me. It definitely wasn't that mine that I put down. Either way, we see this is actually one of our side objectives, so I, like the hero I am, run in, plant a satchel charge, put a few shots where the sun don't shine, and on we went towards the rumored resistance encampment. And not for nothing, this one is actually hidden compared to every other camp we've seen previously, but that Fire, put that out. We unlock a workbench and receive another request from our resistance allies for us to take out someone named Becker. Making my way over to the first of the plane wrecks, I stumble upon a farm crawling with Germans and a sniper on Overwatch. But of course, what really interested me was this big pile of explosive barrels. From this point on, I knew my personal goal was to blow it up. So I booby trapped this body and tossed a bottle around this way to try to lure this officer into my trap. There were complications, but he made a fine addition to my collection. Election, and I went about trying to find someone who would make the thing go boom. I did get slightly distracted here doing some recon, but quickly I got back at it, tossed another friend in my pile, but unfortunately someone did stumble upon my surprise just a little too fast fucking early. For this transgression, it was now open season. But of course, remembering the whole reason I was here, I set out to find the pilot of the downed plane. The big, obvious, muddy footprints were simple enough to follow and lead me down into the cellar of this farmhouse where I found an actually alive NPC, which was a surprise. I feel like in these sorts of missions, Carl only ever finds dead
dead bodies. The pilot let us know he's cool to hang out until the resistance can come get him, but that his captain was captured by the Nazis and they took him somewhere involving a train. Knowing there's a train yard spitting distance from here, I decide that couldn't possibly be where it is and headed to blow up some AA guns instead. This goes super well, no reason to ask, nothing, nothing else notable happened, but I did stumble upon the wreckage of the second plane in the village. Carl decides the pilot would have tried to get up someplace high and seeing this big ass church, we shimmy on up this pipe and find our second pilot. He seemingly already heard of Carl and respects him immensely, even calling him chief, the most prestigious sign of respect a heterosexual man can give to another. Fortunately, right in this church's backyard is the other AA gun, so we head there to make sure none of our pilots can get shot down. I slice up this nerd for wearing cargo pants, plant the charge, and haul ass out of there, up to the rail yard. Scoping out the area, it became clear to me that I probably shouldn't have used up my silenced ammo on that tank and those guys in pistol range earlier, so I'm going to have to put on my tightest fitting sniper elite jammies and approach this tactically. I was doing a pretty good job of this too, even managing to take out this officer who tried to jump scare me, which fortunately gave me the key I needed for the rail yard. I got my way stealthily down the main building where I was able to melee take down the sniper that had been giving me so much trouble until now, but unfortunately I found the captain the Germans were holding and captive dead. He didn't have the film canister on him, but we were able to find it in his possessions behind a locked door. Now, from here, things start to go a little awry. I was making my way towards the opening of this mine, trying to find the Nazi spy on our kill list, but some jackass saw me, screamed out. It, it was just not a good look. I'll admit I've had better runs than this. But sneaking into the mine, and damn, I should have put on my indie fit. Anyway, our kill list bonus objective calls to take out the spy with an explosion. And I mean, just twist my arm. Seeing where all this goes down, it's absolutely fantastic. The running water guards the officer has brought with him, almost like he trusts the spy as much as the spy trusts him. It's fantastic. And they even mention hearing that Carl was going to be in town. After overhearing everything I needed to convince me I had my man, I tossed them a parting gift and was kind enough to open it up for them. Also, I don't know where anyone's body went, but just look at this singular officer's hat. Look at the detail on there. Unnamed rebellion artist responsible for this? Good job. Job. Onward to the final crashed plane, it's just on the edge of falling into the lake and there's a few enemies patrolling around the wreckage. But what caught my ear was these two Germans talking about the waterfall and how there's probably treasure behind it. Sure enough, I run up to the waterfall and discovering a secret entrance, the final pilot is hiding up behind the waterfall. What a fantastic way to clue us into where to find him and what an amazing job at building this so well into the foliage that I actually walked past the entrance once or twice. The pilot mentions that something sketchy seems to be going on down by the bridge, so I'll be heading there next. The only truly disappointing aspect of this whole map for me is that this bridge that people have referenced about being kind of greasy, there's nothing. There's some satchel charges hidden underneath, but otherwise there's nothing special to find. It feels a bit like some cut content, and if that is the fact, I'm a little disappointed at Rebellion for keeping those mentions in. I thought I was missing something really key and running up and down this bridge looking for whatever I missed, but there's nothing. I totally understand the ever evolving nature of level design and that things need to be cut for various reasons, but at least remove the references, please. Nobody will know things are missing unless you point it out to us. Overall though, aside from that slight disappointment to end on, I do really, really like this level. It feels unique enough in its execution, even though the tasks we're carrying out are essentially the same old things from the levels I don't like, but there's a cohesiveness here that just doesn't exist in the others. Anywho, did I hear someone say they weren't sick of hearing about Project Kraken? I'm joking. Joking, sorta. This level is fantastic, but I can't help but feel like this is the ending to the game we should have gotten. The main goal behind this is to sabotage the new big ass aircraft carrier that the Germans are building using Kraken technology. Two quick observations though. One, the name Kraken Awakes feels really wrong to say, and I think the level description is wrong. They have personal here, but what I think they mean is personnel. Sorry, I had to sneak that in there. I actually had a whole section I cut out of my video for the base game where I point out all the typos and the subtitles because it annoyed me to no end, but I, I'm done, I'm done. This is a great level. It's a very typical fortress kind of setup. You know, like there's a main compound where your initial goal is to just get inside, then you can re 
really get to work. In this scenario, you can either sneak through a side door or go straight through the front. I used the side door once and every other time I went through the front, I definitely picked everyone off. But here's the thing, this is a hard fucking level. As soon as you get inside, there are snipers and personal everywhere. Staying hidden is extremely difficult and more than once, I had to mass execute everyone in a particular radius. I did find taking some quieter weapons and picking up non-lethal ammo wherever I could find them helped a bunch. I can't remember for sure, but I believe non-lethal rounds are either totally silent or at least quieter than regular rounds. I also find they're more reliable at single shot takedowns, which is handy because most of the people you'll be facing in this level are Jaegers, which means their helmet almost always deflects the first shot if it's not armor piercing. I'd love to have a more customized loadout here, but if you'll remember, I'm pretty much just using DLC weapons. But back to the fortress analogy, one of the things that makes this level so interesting is that you can infiltrate from quite a few angles. The carrier itself obviously has multiple decks, so where you enter can totally change how your playthrough goes. And I mean, just getting to a position where you can infiltrate is a real challenge here. Since we're talking about an aircraft carrier, I'm gonna hit you with a bit of an analogy here. In navigation, there's a concept called cumulative error, where by making small, incorrect course adjustments to your route, it can have a bigger and more drastic effect later on down the line. Anyway, that's sort of what this level feels like to me. The decisions you do or do not take very early on in the level can impact you way further in. I think even with a tactical game like Sniper Elite, the actual minute to minute gameplay is very calculated. If you put a trap down, it's likely you're intending it to go off within the next few seconds or minutes, especially so if you're doing something to expedite how quickly it's going to go off. Never so much in this game have I died or really had my back up against the wall because someone that I, 30 to 40 minutes ago, decided to kill or not to kill. The stealth skill asked of the player in this level is just way higher than I think of all the other levels. And while that really is a good thing and something I hope Rebellion carries forward into SE6, once again, I can't help but feel like this is the finale we should have gotten in the base game. You'll notice this time around, the DLC is in its own self-contained story that's tangentially related to the main game. It's just a continuation of the main story. If we're using previous releases as benchmarks for DLC, this time around it kind of feels like they're just selling us the second half of the story. Anyway, once you get inside the carrier, it turns into a really sweaty corridor shooter. The AI, for as much as you can complain about it, will come flying out of doorways and blast right past you. Honestly, I got jump scared once or twice by these speed racers. It's because of this that taking this whole level on silently would be a pretty tough undertaking, at least for me. Now that we're in this tub, we do have a few objectives. One is to sabotage the ship and blow it up. Next, we have to track down Vogel and take him out. And once again, while not being groundbreaking, there's another way to sneak into his room. Besides using a satchel charge or finding the lock combination, there's a little vent you can call through to get to him. I know so far it's just onesie twosie examples like this, but having alternatives for getting to the high value targets will always be appreciated. Next, we just have to head up to the bridge, flip the switch, and once again, put down another their Nazi super weapon. God, Carl's so fucking cool. Of course, before calling it quits, there are a few standalone weapon and cosmetic packs I should probably mention in the interest of completeness. The P1938 is a suppressed pistol that you got as a pre-order bonus, or if you buy the Mega Complete Edition. You can also buy it for a few bucks, but I couldn't bring myself to do so. I'm sure it's great. For Rebellion's 30th birthday, they dropped the Airborne Elite Pack for free. This is a weapon and skin pack, which gives us the Lee Enfield, probably my most used weapon in the game, as well as a Union Jack skin for the Well Rod and a British Parachute Regiment skin for Carl. The Winter Weapon skin is another freebie, giving us an Arctic Camo skin for all weapons. Of all the weapon skins that we've gotten thus far, this one is by far the most palatable. The Valentine's Weapon skin was a free drop release for Valentine's Day, I mean, obviously, and it gave us the Cherry Hunter skin for the 1911. It's a little frustrating to be honest that there are so many skins that are locked down to singular weapons. It's like Halo Infinite not having cross-core armor customization at launch. Yeah, did you think I wasn't going to sneak a Halo reference in here? Of course, for all the smack I've been 
been talking about weapon skins and their viability as actual camo options, all of the criticism leaves my body when I see something that's pink or purple. Last on our list is the Trench Warfare Pack. It gave us a whopping three weapons to top up the arsenal. These were the Carl Gustav SMG, the Trench Gun, and the Double 1866 Pistol. The Carl Gustav is a pretty fair SMG. The range feels a little shallow, so it wouldn't be my first choice. Now the Trench Gun, that's another story. It's essentially the drilling shotgun with more rounds, albeit with a slightly longer period between shots. And for the final DLC weapon of this video, we have the double 1866 pistol. Frankly, one of the most useless pistols in the game, but also the most fun to dick around with. In closing, I think we need to look at what we're getting here through two different lenses because depending which one, my thoughts are going to be completely different. If we're judging the SE5 DLC purely on the merits of the levels and extra content we're getting, I'm very pleased. I think the levels we get give us some great variety, and there's some legitimate showpieces nestled in there. Plus, they can all be run in some pretty different ways. I think there's something here for everyone. But if we look at the DLC in terms of value, I think it's pretty rough. If I wasn't going to make this video, I probably would have waited much, much longer to pick them up. The first season Season pass is $45 and the second season pass is $39. That's a steep barrier to entry for all but the most enamored Sniper Elite fans. And I know this is sort of the state of gaming we're in. I'm entirely aware that most games are going to be launching with season passes that you can buy from day one. But that doesn't mean you can't criticize certain publishers for doing it just because everyone else is. I hope the simple fact that I've made multiple hours of content about their games shows that I do have an immense amount of respect for Rebellion. And it's because I respect them that I hold them to this higher standard. I don't know when or if we'll be seeing a Sniper Elite 6 on the horizon, but if we do, I hope there are at least a few lessons from SE5 that stuck. This has been an escape from my analog nightmare. Good luck in yours.